Okay, so we're going to get this all in one take. Welcome to Sunday School for Scientists, or the Bible for Revolutionary Humanists. I'm not for sure what I'm going to name it. Essentially, I see how the religious people, they go to church every goddamn fucking, you know, Sunday, and then they're reading the fucking Bible. They're just reinforcing their fucking brain with stupidity. Just dumb, you know, just assholic bigotry with their bullshit constantly. So what... The, the, what should scientists be doing? Scientific-minded people should be doing the exact same thing. Reinforcing our mind with the truth, with science. So that's what this whole thing is about. Okay, so starting off, just scientific facts, really. So there's 100 million transistors in smartphones. There's 100 million in this smartphone right here that I'm using. There's 100 million transistors inside of it. Do you know what a transistor is? You probably should, since you use a smartphone every goddamn day. Over a billion transistors are in computers. So in the computer on the laptop that the smartphone is resting on, there is a billion of them. So uh, you know, transistors, there's also transistors in televisions, radios. They're all over the place. Do you know what a transistor is? Why don't you? Do you know what, how a combustible engine works? You, you, that's pretty revolutionary. Uh, steel, the Bessemer process, that's pretty revolutionary too. So let's keep going. Instead of going backwards a thousand to two thousand years in the darkness, you know, back to the stone, bronze, iron age, when, you know, people just like would wipe their ass with their hand and shit. Let's move forward a thousand, two thousand years. Instead of going back a uh, thousand years of darkness, let's have a thousand years of light. Okay, so. Gravity is the attractive force exerted by all objects on all, all other objects. So gravity, that is an attractive force for every single object out here on one to the other. Now, with small things, it's not as noticeable, but it's noticeable when it comes to Earth and when it comes to the planets and it comes to the moon. So again, gravity is the attractive force exerted by all objects on all other objects. Gravity is the reason why all things that go up on Earth must also come back down. Gravity also explains why the moon revolves around the Earth and why the planets revolve around the sun. Newton's theory of gravity is based on the model that bodies attracted each other with a force that is proportional to a quantity called their mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And that's important. I'm going to repeat it again. Um, the uh, Newton's theory of gravity is based on the model that bodies attracted each other with a force that was proportional to a quantity called their mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Newton's theory of gravity predicts the motions of the sun, the moon, the planets to a high degree of accuracy. Now, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, general theory of relativity predicts a slightly different motion than Newton's theory does. And it's been verified, which is a crucial confirmation that Einstein's general theory of relativity is actually a more accurate model for viewing the world. But many folks still use Newton's theory. Oh, holy shit. That was snow. Okay, so uh, still use Newton's theory of gravity for the most practical purposes because the difference between its predictions and those of general relativity are very small. So Newton's theory of relativity, or my bad, Newton's theory of gravity has the advantage of being simpler to use in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So what is, you know, since it's a simpler model, you know, if you just need to quickly sketch out where the planets are going to be at a certain time, it's easier just to use Newton's theory of gravity. And it's based on the model that bodies attracted each other. The bodies are attracted to each other with a force that is proportional to a quantity called their mass. So that's why Earth is such a big ball, then, you know, gravity brings things down to Earth because it's such a huge mass. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And I believe those are together. So, uh, one last time, Newton's theory of gravity is based on the model that bodies attracted each other with a force that was proportional to a quantity called their mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So, you have Earth, you got the mass, you got the apple, you got the mass, and then how far is the apple away from Earth? And then that's the force 
that the gravity will bring the apple back down to Earth. A day on Mercury lasts for two-thirds of the year's planet. A day on Mercury lasts for two-thirds of the planet's year. So, a year, two-thirds, uh, uh, this is from Stephen Hawkins, okay? So, during the day, um, so that's a long day, right? Two-thirds of the planet's year just, you know, is, is day. But during the day, temperatures on Mercury reaches 400 degrees Celsius or 752 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the dead of night, it falls to almost negative 200 degrees Celsius or negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit. 451. And that's not subliminal. You know, it was fucking obvious, right? So 1984, Zam Yatin's We. If we're all, you know, all into pure science, then what the hell will happen? Pure scientific society, all constructed together. In fact, this uh, Zam Yatin, you have Yevgeny Zam Yatin. This book was, George Orwell stole this book and wrote 1984 with it. And then I'm also reading Invisible Man. By Ralph Ellison, Habits of the Heart, which is actually fantastic. It's essentially saying that our individualistic nature, whether it's expressive or utilitarian, have limits, and the way that our nation has saved ourselves from our extreme individualism is from biblical and civic traditions. But I'm getting away from the biblical, so maybe this could be biblical, right? Uh, be good people. Choose goodness. If you're a strong person, you'll choose good. It's karma. It doesn't make any sense. You're going to go around hurting people and not expect that to come back to you. It's just sort of common sense. Why would anybody choose anything but goodness? Then Emil. Um, this is one of my favorite. John Jacques Rousseau. How to raise people. How to raise children. Uh, it's a treatise on education. So essentially, my point is, Mercury's days are way too fucking hot, right? You couldn't survive it, 752 degrees Fahrenheit. And then their nights are way too fucking cold, negative 328 degrees Fahrenheit. You couldn't fucking survive that at all. So you couldn't survive the day, you couldn't survive the night. But it does go from hot to cold, so maybe there is like some sort of sliver of Mercury if you just kept moving your house around, kind of like the little prince would do um, to see the sunset if you just kept moving your domicile around perhaps you could actually find that you know balance that delicate balance in between way too fucking hot and way too fucking cold probably not right i mean jesus is so close to the damn sun and the sun i mean the sun is it's a star right but it's our star so we call it the sun and a star is a huge furnace that burns billions of pounds of matter each second and reaches temperatures of tens of millions of degrees at its core Tens of millions of degrees. So talk about hot. That's not even close to, you know, Mercury's close to the sun, but it's not the sun. So you definitely, you know, you would you would be vaporized if you go in there. They burn billions of pounds of matter. How does the sun just keep on bur burning, burning billions of pounds of matter? And that means it vaporizes, right? So where does that matter keep coming from? Does it just keep burning itself and just somehow there's some weird internal thing? That's a good question. It's a question I don't know. But I do know that it's a huge furnace and it burns billions of pounds of matter every fucking second. And it reaches temperatures of tens of millions of degrees at its core. I also heard this one... This is Mr. Heim, 8th grade science teacher, probably the greatest teacher I've ever had. Um, but I didn't, I didn't appreciate him until like a couple years ago, so, um, but, uh, uh, but it's not my fault, what the fuck, I mean, if you go, if you from a home that's like, this is how things are, shut up, and you're not talking about your problems, or you're not talking about solutions to problems, or sort of socializing to try to figure things out, it's all about hierarchy and shut your damn mouth, well, okay, so, but they was able to create a sun in the bathtub, he said that, Somebody was able to create a sun in their bathtub. I mean, that's that's remarkable. Uh, energy is never lost. E equals mc squared, right? Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. That's the constant. E equals mc squared. This is Einstein's famous theory. 
Energy is equal to mass multiplied by the speed of light, i.e. 186,000 miles per second squared. And 186,000 miles per second squared is roughly 34.6 billion miles per second. It's fucking fast as shit, okay? About 34 billion, um, you know, to be exact, it's 34,596,000,000 miles per second. You know, so to be exact, 34, that's what the C squared is. It's, you know, 34.6 billion miles per second. So it's like, just, <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, 186,000 miles per second. I think you can put that in, store that into your memory bank. 186,000 miles per second is the speed of light. The speed of the light has a very specific speed. We know how fast it goes. And it's 186,000 miles per second. So this is important that energy is never lost. So, you know, when we die, our energy goes somewhere, right? So energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. So a little bit of mass should be able to generate a shit ton of energy. And we find that out with, you know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So if you were to split a uranium atom, you take uranium, you take an atom, right? It's smaller than what I'm doing here. Uh, but take a uranium, uh, uranium atom, split it, and then boom, Hiroshima's fucking gone. If you take a plutonium atom, plutonium, then you can wipe out all and split the plutonium atom. Then you'll wipe out all the humanity in Nagasaki. And, you know, a quarter million of people, quarter of a million people were wiped out in a second. So, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were actually some of the most disgusting war crimes, crimes against humanity that has ever been perpetuated. And people say, nah, we needed to do it to end the war. Yeah, those same people probably fucking talk good about Hitler, too. Um, but that's not true. The reason why FDR or Truman, why they wanted to drop it was to scare Stalin into submission. Look at the weapons that we got and you need to shut your fucking mouth. I mean, if we needed to demonstrate that we had the capability, we didn't actually need to blow up people and bodies. You know, we could have just done it out in the ocean and, and videotaped it and then sent the videotape to whoever the... Who the fuck was the leader of Japan? I mean, all this shit about Hitler but and Mussolini, but Japan is the one that fucking bombed us, right? So, yeah, it was a horrible crime, but the... the and uh, Einstein realized this, that his equations essentially, you know, led to the atomic bomb because energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So just take an atom, a uranium atom, split it, boom, you know, you wipe out Hiroshima, and then you uh, split plutonium, you wipe out Nagasaki. A quarter million people are dead. And, um, and then you can also use that sort of same technology. That's how you can get all that energy, right? How much energy comes from just a splitting of these radioactive uh, elements? It, it was uranium and plutonium, right? That's what uh, Doc uh, Brown on um, uh, Back to the Future, that's what he had... That's what he had got, right? So, um, one of them. Uranium, plutonium. So, and also that guy, that uh, Russian spy had just died from, I think, drinking plutonium. So, next scientific fact. When you put things away in your house, it's best if you designate a specific spot for each and every thing. Then it's organized. You know exactly where your socks are. You know exactly where the fork is. You know exactly where the, you know, the milk is. And that's... You know, women are going to say, oh, that's obvious. Really? Well, you're not sharing that fucking information. Why don't you fucking share that information with others? Because I just figured that shit out. Uh, one second, a beam of light will travel 186,000 miles in one second. And that's important. So I'll repeat it because it's important to just 186,000 miles per second. Memorize that. Say that over and over again 20 times until it's in your permanent memory bank. When it's in your permanent memory bank, becomes a part of your being, then you don't have to relearn it anymore. That's one of the reasons why this you know, scientific knowledge should be reinforced over and over again. Uh, because you can never, you know, there's no limits to what you can learn. Get those wrinkles in your brain, right? And you can just keep on shoveling information, information, information constantly into your brain and it never, it will never explode. There's no such thing as your brain being full. I also want you to memorize not just the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, but also learn Proxima Centauri. So the closest star to our solar system 
excluding the sun. The, the closest star to our solar system, to Earth, is Proxima Centauri. That's the name of the star. Why don't, the, why don't you fucking know that? That's, you know, because you're too b busy learning about what the fuck ever you learn in church. So say Proxima Centauri with me 20 fucking times. Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri. Say it so many times it becomes lodged in your brain, just like the speed of light and all these other facts that I'm going to be saying uh, on this uh, Sunday and, you know, every other Sunday school, you know, for scientists for the rest of of our lives. So Proxima Centauri is also called Alpha Centauri C and it's four light years away. So four light years. A light year is the distance that light can travel within a year. If it can travel 186,000 miles per second, we'll figure out how many seconds in a year there are and then that's, you know, and then you can figure out how many light years there are, or how much, uh, how long light years are. And then after you do that, then multiply it by four. That's how fucking far Proxima Centauri is. So it's fucking far as shit, okay? Light years, light years is such a, it's such a small word, but it is like, light year is such a fucking big uh, unit of uh, time or unit of measurement. A light year. 186,000 miles. Just to walk a fucking mile would take forever, but in light, 186,000 miles happens in a second, and then just take, you know, how many seconds are in an hour versus, you know, multiply the, uh, uh, that by how many hours are in a day, how many weeks, days are in a week, and how many weeks there are in a year, and that's a light year. That's a light year. How many seconds are in a light year, and then multiply that by 186,000. And so that's where Proxima Centauri is four light years away, and it's so far away that even with the fastest spaceship on the drawing boards today, a trip to it would take us about 10,000 years. So nobody in our lifetime is ever going to see Proxima Centauri. We might see a ship. You know, sort of like the Robinson, you know, family lost in space. The colony, we might see someone, you know, set out a voyage to Proxima Centauri, but we'll never actually see it ourselves. So we might see that initial voyage, and we might see a hundred years of it, but even our children and our children's children wouldn't see Proxima Centauri if we were to get on that ship today. Ten thousand years. So, you know, if we were to assume a hundred years, which isn't actually a good estimation of a person's life, 76 is America's average life span. But if you were to take 10,000, a hundred being the average lifespan, then it would take, you know, a hundred uh, people. It would take a hundred centuries, a hundred generations uh, to live on this ship, to colonize, to work on this ship before we got to the Proxima Centauri solar system. Because you don't actually want to run into the sun, right? That's a, or the star. Um, it's actually like a small star too, I heard. But you don't want to run into it, right? You just want to sort of discover around it. But that's 10,000 years. And so it would take 100. It would take 100 generations. And that would be, I think it'd be worth it for scientific progress. And I bet you there's some uh, adventurous people that would love to take that trip. So is it possible to terraform Mars? I don't know. This is also something worth figuring out. You know, once we fucked up this planet, then we'll have another planet to go to, right? Another planet to fuck up. And uh, living in a spaceship, right, for 10,000 years might be better for the Masters family while we're going to Proxima Centauri. We'll be sending you all information everything going back. And it'll be, hell, that'd be a good reality show, right? And have advertisements and shit. People would love that show. Um, and we can also have a biodome, right? Have a biodome on the moon. As long as I'm not stuck with Pauly Shore. I would love to be stuck with Kate Gunthorpe. I don't think she understands. Either she understands, you know, that she's my dream woman. Like, I never even knew that uh, Kate Gunthorpe could even be, you know, alive or created. But apparently, you know, she's here. And she's a unicorn. And it's a dream come true. But she doesn't love me. Or, actually, she don't even like men. <laughs> Which is sort of, you know, true for most women. But she's, you know... Uh, her sexual orientation is towards women, which I, I think might be true. <laughs> Planets is a Greek word for wanderer. So this is, again, more from a briefer history of time. Uh, it's by Stephen Hawking. Out of the thousands of lights in the sky, the Greeks had noticed that there were five planets. The, 
the Greeks, thousands of fucking years ago, right? Maybe 2,000 years ago. This is the shit that they knew, and we don't even fucking know this shit now because we're learning about fucking Noah's Ark and all this other dumb shit. So, when the Greeks look up at the sky, they saw all the stars. They saw thousands of lights, right? All the stars. But they noticed that five of those lights, and not counting the moon, but five of those lights out of all those stars did not move with the rest of the lights. The rest of the stars seemed to move in concert with each other, right? We're rotating, and so, you know, the constellations kind of pretty much stay put, or depending on how it rotates, it looks like they're all moving in concert with one another. But the five lights would wander off from a regular east-west path, and then it would double back. And so the Greeks noticed that these five wandering lights were the planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So these are the only planets that could be seen with the naked eye. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. We can see these with our own, with the telescope, with our own eyeballs. I mean, this is remarkable. When you learn science, you learn that the world is a discoverable place, and it's not so scary and confusing. Evolution is when a species evolves over time to take best advantage, uh, to best take advantage of their surrounding environment, and those species most fit for their environment survive the best. It's Darwinism, natural selection. Evolution is definitely true, so is global warming. The Big Bang Theory, it feels true. The universe is expanding, so if it contracted, it contract to a single point. It gives you a nice little timeline, you know, of when things began. It feels true, but I haven't researched it enough to definitively say yes or no. But I'm also not so skeptical that I become a nihilist, right? I believe in gravity. I think gravity is true. I think, therefore, I am. All you know logically is that you're a thinking substance. That's all you fucking know. That's it. Because you can doubt your perceptions. But science, uh, scientific progress is based upon our observations, our perceptions, how we look at the world, our experiments, our theories, and whether or not those experiments uh, validate or detract from those theories. That's exactly how the fuck you're supposed to look at the world, right? If I walk out and I give the people money at the grocery store and they give me, you know, uh, they let me take my groceries out, that's a scientific experiment that says that I can pay them money and I get my fucking groceries and I walk out. That's a successful, right? A theory is next time I go there, I'll give them money and I'll be able to walk out with fucking groceries. If you believe in God and faith and all that bullshit, well, fucking, why do you stop at a red light? Just close your eyes and just do as the fuck as you please with no regard for the morrow with anybody else. What happens to anybody? Just do as the fuck as you please and have faith. Have faith. The only way I understand religious people is if they tell me that they believe in science. But, you know, they could say that shit but not actually do it. Even people who believe in science, I don't know if they're reinforcing their understanding of the world with scientific principles. Which, this will be a video that I think I'll actually watch myself. Okay, so... Now, about humans. Humans did not descend from chimpanzees, but we do both have the same ape-like ancestor. So, again, with the evolution, evolution is just that a species changes, and then that change helps it uh, to better to adapt to its environment. And I want to say there was... Um, I don't know, Galapagos Island, Darwin, he had turtles or something, I don't know. There's been lots of animals and creatures that have slightly changed and then that change made them the snow owl. I don't know, something about they had spots and then it had uh, snow and it could better blend in with the snow because it was white so therefore predators couldn't kill it. And so it was evolutionary, it was Darwinism. Darwinism was the reason why that you know the uh, that why humans were able to come into being we didn't come from chimpanzees or bonobos those are our cousins but chimpanzees bonobos humans we all came from the same ape like creature and so ape like creature they've been around for you know probably for quite some time but modern humans have only been around here for 100,000 to 200,000 years so again modern human beings when we spun off from this ape-like creature, when we became um, Homo sapiens, I think, hominids, when we started walking upright, um, modern humans, <laughs> modern humans, and this actually comes out of uh, People's History of the World by uh, Chris Harmon, which is uh, Howard Zinn used that as his sort of Bible for the, you know, uh, the world uh, history 
and um, in Zen uh, history, people's history, the United States is definitely the Bible for Americans, which we should study and fuck your textbooks. So, modern humans came about 100 to 200,000 years. I've heard 150,000. So we've only been on this planet for 150,000 years. Now, Earth, you know, compared humans to Earth, Earth is 4.543 billion years old. Billion with a B. Nine zeros. Four nine zeros billion years old. So Earth isn't 6,000 years, you silly, silly, stupid-ass Christian fundamentalist dumb motherfuckers. It's 4.543 billion years old, give or take a few million. And now you're going to say, oh, how do you know how old Earth is? It's easy, okay? The dating technology of Earth is based on evidence from radiometric age dating of meteorite material, and it's consistent with the radiometric ages of the oldest known terrestrial uh, terrestrial and lunar samples following the development of radiometric age dating in the early 20th century in the 1900s measurements of lead in uranium rich minerals sh uh, showed that some were in excess of a billion years old the oldest such minerals analyzed to date small crystals of zircon from the jack hills of western australia are at least 4.404 billion years old. So I just said it was 4.5 billion years old, and these small crystals of a zircon from the Jack Hills of Western Australia are at least 4.404 billion years old. So we know at the very least the Earth has to be as old as its oldest rock, and its oldest rock is 4.4 billion, and so we just added another 0.1 billion onto it. Um, so, comparing the mass and the luminosity of the sun to those of other stars, it appears that the solar system cannot be much older than those rocks. The small crystals of Zircon, Z-I-R-C-O-N, from the Jack Hills of Western Australia, um, those rocks. Calcium, aluminum-rich inclusions, the oldest known solid constituents within meteorites that are formed within the solar system, are 4.567 billion years old, given an age for the solar system and an upper limit for the age of the Earth. So, by the uh, meteorites, right, these rocks that are going, that are circling around the sun along with all these planets, we have found that within one of these meteorites, they're actually older, right, 4.567, whereas uh, Earth was 4.543. So 567 is higher than 543. And so therefore Earth has to be at least, you know, younger than the meteorites, but it has to be at least as old as 4.40. So there's, you know, there's a um a span, there's a range. It's at least between 4.567 and 4.404, uh, but 4.543 billion years old. That's how old Earth has been. Uh, billions of years, Earth has been here for a long ass time. Humans, modern humans, have only been here 100 to 200,000 years. 150,000 years. And so, our distant ancestors evolved out of a species of ape which lived some 4 or 5 million years ago in parts of Africa. For some unknown reason, members of this species gave up living in trees, as do our closest animal relatives, the common chimpanzee. And the bonobo. The bonobo is often called the pygmy chimpanzee. And it took to walking upright. So, 100 to 200,000 years ago, well, you know, uh, like the, how the chimpanzees and the bonobos were, our common ape like ancestor were climbing around the trees, and then that's how they were living. But eventually, we evolved from that species of this ape-like creature, which isn't a chimpanzee or a bonobo, uh, but eventually that ape-like creature, you know, uh, evolves into the chimp and the bonobo. But it lived four to five million years ago. So the chimpanzees, uh, the ape-like creature that, you know, sorry, the ape-like creature has been around for four or five million years ago. Humans have only been around 150,000 years. And so for some reason, this species, the humans, stopped living in trees, and then they started walking upright. Well, that changes the whole game right there. 
And the humans were able to survive in their new terrain by cooperating more than any other species of mammal working together to make rudimentary tools. Sometimes chimps do this to dig up roots to reach the high berries to gather grubs and insects, kill small animals and frighten off predators. By this, by us cooperating and working together, we were able to survive farther and better than any of the animals that have ever existed on planet Earth. By cooperation. So this idea of us fighting against one another, competition, scarcity of resources, this is not natural. When you don't talk about human nature, human nature, we initially survived because we were cooperative and we worked together with one another to ensure all of our survival. So that's 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to cut it off.